My name's Robert Smith. I've not put any names on the, uh, my name on the front slide here because I'm here talking about the telescope, which is, of course, operated by, built and operated by quite a large group of people, half a dozen or so of us, um, who operate the telescope routinely. And also the science results I'll be showing later on, of course, belong to the astronomers who are doing the research, not us who run the telescope. So it didn't really seem fair, just put my name on the front. So I put name names on the film. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the robotic telescope itself, why we built it, what it's for, and what is unique about it. Um, tell you a little bit about how it runs, this section here about the observer's experience, and how using a robotic telescope is different from using a traditional telescope, which most people are used to. And then hopefully, if I don't ramble on too long, I'll be able to show you some of the actual science results that are coming out of the telescope and what it's being used for. So the first question of, of, of what this telescope is for. Um, if you look at historically where astronomy has developed or, or, and the way in which astronomy has, has been done historically, we started off very simply working in the spatial domain, images. It's a posh way, spatial domain, just a posh way of saying images. And these are hand-drawn images by Lord Ross, 19th century. Um, and that's, that's sort of the first thing people think about when they talk about astronomical data, just imaging data. Of course, we've come a long way. And this is an important point that we've done a lot of development on the imaging. And now we have this exquisite high resolution imaging from all sorts of telescopes. This is Hubble Space Telescope, of course, looking at gravitational lenses, these beautiful arc structures. Um, but the point is that there's been a lot of, a lot of work and a lot of advance done in this, in this spatial domain. Images are 2D spatial domain science. Um, you can project that into three dimensions and do redshift surveys. So here we're looking at the distribution of matter scattered throughout the three-dimensional space from a redshift survey, the 2DF redshift survey. But again, this is essentially talking about the distribution of material in space. So it's, it's a spatial study of what is in the universe and where it is and how it's arranged and how they relate to each other. Another way of looking at astronomy is the spectral domain. Again, this is just a posh way of saying colors. But the, the, the basic idea here is that Things look different at different wavelengths of light. Uh, so as just an example here, we've got a dense dust cloud looking in towards the center of the galaxy and moving from the blue in the top left through visible red and into the infrared on the bottom. You see the universe looks very different at, very different at different wavelengths. In this case, in the infrared, you're penetrating through the dust cloud and seeing the background stars. So in the bottom one here, we're seeing all the background stars, which are there in this picture, but they're just blocked out by the dust cloud in the blue. In the infrared, we can see them. Um, the spectral domain also, of course, includes the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, we're familiar with doing astronomy from radio all the way through to gamma rays. Um, so you have, there was, has there been a lot of development in the last sort of 20 years or so in multi wavelength studies where people are trying to use instruments at all sorts of different wavelengths from very, very hardest high energy photons down to the very long wavelength radio to understand the astrophysics of objects. This again, this is all looking at the spectral domain. You can combine those two, and the color image is effectively just a combination of spatial and spectral information. That's what a color image is. Um, so this is included, I include this picture for a couple of reasons. One is they're just so beautiful, and um, of course, you know, these are recent images from the HST released a couple of months ago, a month or so ago. Exquisitely detailed and beautiful, impressive. Um, but also they show interacting galaxies. And interaction is the next point that I want to think about. Both the spatial surveys that we've done and the spectral surveys that we do traditionally look at what the universe is like at a particular moment. So then you go off and write your paper about what you saw at the time you took your observation. But we, we were, what we were interested in is the time domain, basically time variable astronomy. And there is a lot of time variable astronomy. Uh, we see things varying. We know of sources in the universe that vary on time scales from seconds to years. In fact, we know much shorter, uh, much longer than that. But this is the sort of range which we'll be talking about. And there's a lot of very good physical reasons for wanting to study time variable sources. Very rapidly varying sources must be small just because of the requirement for a causal link between two parts of the object. 
for it to vary up and down in brightness very quickly, it must itself physically be small. Let's say here on the process of you know, thousands of hundreds of thousands of miles, but on astronomical scales, of course, these these are very small. So an object that's varying on time scales of a second must be this sort of size or smaller. We might also be interested in very long-term time evolution of interacting objects on periods of years. Um, of course, the, the, uh, the galaxies that we saw in the previous slide, these are interacting on time scales of thousands, millions of years, tens of millions of years. So although they're interesting to us astrophysically, they're not very interesting to us observationally because we wouldn't be able to observe those variations. So we're interested in these time scales from, from seconds to years where there's all sorts of things going on in the universe. And another aspect of time domain astrophysics then is the target opportunity and the rare events. Things that happen spontaneously without warning, supernovae, gamma ray bursts. Um, also, not necessarily explosions like that, but maybe asteroids, unknown asteroids, incoming asteroids that pass very close to the Earth. You don't know about them until very late. So they become a target opportunity because you only find out about them fairly late. So you want a rapid response to be able to get onto these things quickly. Now, variable, you know, all these things we've known for a long time. You're sitting there thinking, well, no, none of this is new. We know about variable stars. We know, you know, we know people still supernovae. So why is this exciting and new? It's not overall new, but it has actually historically been an incredibly difficult area of astronomy to work in. And it's been very, very little advance. I showed those advances that have been made in the imaging. Uh, from the, the earliest hand-drawn images up to you know, sub-arc second resolutions now. But in the area of time domain astrophysics, there's been relatively little advance for a variety of reasons. Most of them are not technical, but uh, cultural. It's just to do with the way we do astronomy. Traditionally, most astronomers work by writing their science application. They're granted a block of three or four nights of time on the telescope. You go to the telescope, you make your observations, you go home. If it rains on your night, then that's just bad luck. You've lost your time. You can reapply next year. That's the worst way it goes. Um, and that's been OK for certain areas of physics, for certain areas of astrophysics. But obviously, if someone wants to study the variation of a single bright star and understand the, the physics going on in a single star, uh, that doesn't really work very well. I mean, if you write a time application to a panel saying, I've got this bright star. I need about a 10 second exposure of it, and I need it every night for five years. So can I have the telescope for five years, and I'll take one 10 second exposure every night? <laughs> You're obviously not going to get the time. Um, so uh, that's just an example of how the current paradigm, or the, the prevailing paradigm for the scheduling of telescopes, just doesn't support time domain astrophysics. And the other problem then are the overrides. These are the targets of opportunity. If something exciting happens, you phone up the telescope and say, please, 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 can you observe this object for me? It will be gone tomorrow. And you'll often get the data. But you get the data taken by the person who happened to be at the telescope at the time, who's observed it in their own favorite way, not necessarily what you asked for, and who was probably a bit grumpy about phoned up and asked to give you their time. Now, I've been overridden on telescopes like this. And I can assure you there's. A lot of ill will in the control room sometimes when your observations get overridden by someone phoning in to say, oh, you've got to do this now. Um, and you have to ask sometimes whether you want your data taken by people under those sorts of circumstances. <laughs> this is just an example of that. This is uh, an example of what I was talking about where you're looking at a particular interesting star that you want to monitor over a long period of time. Now, you've got a beautiful light curve here. Oops, I just shut the thing down. There you go. Uh, you've got a beautiful light curve here. But this light curve, over a period of a couple of years, is all from uh, amateur observers observing backyard. And the observations are a mixture of V-band, uh, the green points are V-band CCD data, and the black points are actually literal eyeball observations. You see it's a very good light curve, very well sampled. Um, the eyeball data is excellent compared to the CCD data. So you know, it, they do a really nice job. But of course, you're limited in only be able to use the objects which are bright enough for the average backyard astronomer. You've got a heterogeneous data set here that's observed by many different people. But also, possibly most importantly, these are all V-band. Um, this is a dwarf nova from an observing program on the LP. Uh, so here you've got a close interacting pair, binary pair of stars. 
You've got two different stars. You've got accretion disk. You've got different sections of accretion disk. There's hot spots on the star. All of these are radiating at different wavelengths, different colors. What you really want is multi-wave band. If you want a light curve like this, multi-wave band. So you want to have filters on your telescope and be observing at this sort of time sampling in order to do astrophysics. So although the amateur data is, is certainly incredibly impressive and very useful, there's a lot that can be done with a, quote, professional telescope, which just hasn't been possible at all. This is another example of uh, what you can do with, in the time domain. Um, RoboNet was a prototype network of telescopes. We were operating three telescopes here, uh, one in Australia, one in La Palma, and one in Hawaii. And they were being operated together in a single network so that observation could be handed off from one to the next. So here we see the, uh, the Falk South Telescope observing. And uh, when sunrise arise, arrives there, you'll notice that sunset has just arrived at La Palma. So the observation can be handed off to La Palma, and then the observation can be handed off again to Hawaii, and you can get almost 24-hour coverage of the object. And that can be done in an automated manner from one telescope to the next. Now, this is probably the best point for me to advertise Las Cumbres, another, uh, another project. Um, RoboNet, as I said, is our prototype of this idea of, of a robotic network, uh, which is not operating anymore. And these two telescopes, the Fox North and the Fox South, are now owned and operated by Las Cumbres Observatory, based in Santa Barbara here in California. And they're working uh, very rapidly now on developing a much, much larger network that really would be global coverage building a couple of dozen telescopes rather than the three that we've demonstrated here in the prototype. Uh, but that's Las Cumbres Observatory, which we're not, we're not directly involved with, but we do, we're not directly part of it, but we do collaborate there. So I've been talking about the science reasons for doing, um, for, for a robotic observatory. Robotic observatory is ideal for this time domain observing, where uh, you, you want to be regularly going back to the same objects over and over again. You want rapid response to targets of opportunity. There's a lot of operational reasons why a robotic telescope becomes useful. The first is that because it's robotic, there's nobody there. It's unmanned, which is cheap. Um, it's cheap in travel, not sending people out to the telescope. But more importantly, it's actually cheap in the facilities. We have tiny, tiny control room. We don't have food or water on site. There's no plumbing, um, restricted power. You know, we don't need the infrastructure at the telescope, which is all expensive to build and maintain. So there's a lot of savings to be had there. Reduced travel and reduced accommodation on site. Living on top of a mountain tends to get expensive. Uh, again, just in, in running all these facilities. And then we get to talking to the actual observing and the, the, the advantages of the robotic operation for observing. And it's this flexible scheduling. This is really sort of what I've been alluding to all along, is the ability to adapt your observing program on the fly during the night as things go along. And that might be switching between different programs. Um, it might be switching between different observing strategies depending on the observing conditions. If the seeing, if the image quality starts degrading, or if it starts getting a little bit cloudy, earlier it was, it was nice and clear earlier, but it starts getting a little bit patchy cloud, you can change the observing program automatically on the fly, the telescope, without anybody there to to change the observing program that's being run, to match it to the observing conditions. And then there's these targets of opportunity. And the important word here is the painless there. The fact is, because it's a robot observing, the robot doesn't know or care when it gets overridden by a target of opportunity. So you don't have these cultural problems of astronomers sitting in the control room, fuming to themselves, and getting distracted by other things. Um, another important point is, Homologous data quality. The observations are made in the same way every night by the same software process. So when you're doing long-term monitoring, that has obvious advantages, that you know the data being taken in a consistent manner over and over again. It makes it much easier to automate all your pipelines, automate all your data reduction and analysis, and understand errors and error analyses in your final, in final papers. And of course, the fact that these are robotic, again, nobody involved, no communications problems, as well. Computers have their communication problems, but um, that obviously simplifies these intra-observatory handoffs from one telescope to the next. If you want to try and build the network, um, the only sane way to try and build that network is through robotic telescopes, not through having individuals at every site trying to negotiate between each other. So how does that, all that relate 
to the real world. What's, what's, what's life like in a robotic telescope different from a normal telescope? Just got a couple of pictures here to sort of illustrate all of what I've said in the previous charts. Um, here's a traditional telescope control room. With lots of astronomers sitting at lots of terminals, doing lots of work. One person analyzing data, one person monitoring the telescope, one person deciding what's going to be observed next. Nice bright lit room, computers, desks, and a hive of activity. Now, the Liverpool telescope. <laughs> There's me. <laughs> That's one of my colleagues. Um, there's nothing to do because the telescope's running itself. And also, you notice, no room. there's a big rack of computers. There's a, there's a rack here full of computers all doing stuff. Um, but it's not us making those decisions. Now, even this isn't actually quite true. It gets better than this. If you look at the, the date up there, uh, this is off the webcam. It's actually 2005. This was during a commissioning run where we were doing some engineering tests. Um, so on an ordinary everyday night, of course, it doesn't even look like that. There's a picture of the control room a couple of nights ago while the telescope was observing because there's nobody there. It's totally unmanned. It's totally unsupervised. We don't have anybody remotely observing. It's, it's looking after itself. Right. So that's a, a summary of, uh, of, of why we want to go robotic and why we want a robotic telescope. Um, the word robotic telescope, though, is banded down because a lot, a lot of people talk about having robotic telescopes, and there are a lot of robotic telescopes in the world. So I wanted to focus down a little bit more on exactly what I mean in this context for the, for the Liverpool telescope. The first thing to say is uh, I'm talking here about optical telescopes. Um, don't get involved in radio observatories at this, in this discussion. So we're, we're talking here about the optical. But, but the point of the slide is there are a lot of robotic telescopes in the world of all sorts of sizes and shapes and types and designs. Um, and all of them, most of them, do good science, good research for all sorts of different reasons. This is a summary of all the projects that I am aware of. I've pinched the, uh, the base list from Rick Hessman, who's also in, interested in robotic telescopes, and replotted and reformatted it all in my own nefarious way. But uh, the basic survey of, of all of the projects is, is maintained by Rick. Um, and what I'm looking at here is basically the, the aperture distribution. So from small telescopes, you know, just little, um, well, it is a quarter meter, 25 centimeter telescopes, up to the last column here being telescopes bigger than one and a quarter meters. Um, and you immediately get the impression that most robotic telescopes are very, very small. Um, and you also get the impression that people are moving towards wanting to build these things. You see there's a lot of projects underway, I've got 18 here, to build large robotic telescopes. But very few actually operational. So they're the sort of main two conclusions from that. A second way of plotting the same data is what are those telescopes used for? And what is the science being done on the telescopes? Uh, the first one, the, by far the biggest, you know, a third of all the, tele, all the robotic telescopes, are basically dedicated to gamma ray bursts. It's an absolute prime area for robotic observing because it's rapid response. You've got seconds to get onto these things. So it's an ideal project for getting the human out of the loop and automating everything. A um, very large fraction of them are educational use. They're predominantly designed for use in the classroom by school kids, which is a good thing. And then lots of other different projects. Um, what does service mean? It's hard to say, but mainly, I'll come down over, they are telescopes which have an application procedure for saying what you want to do. Um, but I'll sort of come to that in the next slide, um, is that those that claim to be service in that slide, I've sort of gone through and figured out by myself what I think is, you know, is this telescope basically designed for a special purpose with some small slice of time that is available for open application? Or is this telescope actually designed to be a common user telescope that can do all sorts of different things? And by plotting it this way, you see you know, the vast majority of these robotic telescopes are dedicated to a particular project. They may have a slice of time that's available for application, um, but, but their main raison d'etre is a particular science project. Um, example, for example, in the, uh, the piece Palmar P60, it was very, very successful in the gamma ray burst follow-up. Um, about 20% of its time is 
open for application uh, for people to do other research on it. Um, but that 20% is actually only available within the Caltech system and the direct collaborators with the telescope. Um, so I, you know, I haven't classified that as a common user instrument, really. It's a private instrument that's mostly dedicated to one project and does do other projects as well. has been incredibly successful. Um, but I've not called it a common user instrument. But anyway, so this is what I'm interested in, or what we were interested in in Liverpool, what we wanted to try and build, was this common user robotic telescope. An ordinary, everyday telescope, just like the ones people are used to using to do general purpose, common user research, but entirely robotically operated and scheduled. In fact, yeah, we've got down here a few, but in fact, if we restrict this definition to you know, what I've, I'm clearly converging on, which is you know, a large, greater than one meter um, instrument with a, a telescope with a variety of instruments that can do imaging, spectroscopy, polarimetry, you know, more than one instrument, and is open for um, application, open application from any astronomers, not just a private institutional, then basically there's only one that I know of. Uh, no, one's, no one's argued with me when I've said this in the past. <laughs> and that's the Liverpool Telescope. There are, other, there are others that are definitely heading this way. I, I referred earlier to Las Cumbres Observatory. Um, they have many ideals that are very similar to us. A lot of what they're trying to do is very similar to us. Um, it's, it's still principally a, a private institute rather than open for common application. But they have a very enlightened policy to collaborating. So, you know, these borderlines. But the point is, this is what we wanted to build. A fairly ordinary, if you can have an ordinary two-meter telescope. These specs I won't go through because they're, they're typical Richie Cretion two-meter optical telescope. Um, but the important point is totally unmanned robotic operation. And down the bottom here, um, another important point for us is the broad instruments complement, so that people can do whatever they want with it. Uh, so I'll, I'll run quickly through a discussion of some of the instrumentation. I won't go into detail of actually all the instruments and how they work. Uh, but one very important thing for the robotic observation, useful for any telescope, but vital for our, our operations model, is the rapid switch between instruments. We need to have all the instruments permanently mounted, and we need to be able to switch between them in a few seconds. So when the conditions change, when the programs change, the telescope can switch instrument. So we use this ANG box system, many telescopes do, where these, each of these black plates can be removed and an instrument mounted on it. And then there's a flat fold mirror inside the ANG box in the middle here, in the middle, which just picks off the beam and sends it to one of the instruments. So to change instrument, all you have to do is rotate that mirror to send the beam to a different instrument. And that allows us to do this uh, instrument change very quickly, less than 30 seconds, to change from one program, observing program, to another. Or multiple, instru multiple instruments within a single program. So that's the back end of the telescope, and you can see where the uh, instruments all mount. Um, it looks slightly more scary when the instruments are on, and the telescope is basically invisible. <laughs> but uh, lots of boxes, lots of cables, and a fully instrumented telescope that's in routine operation. This is a, just a quick list of what they are. We have an optical imager. We have an infrared imager, near-infrared imager, JH only at the moment. We have a polarimeter. Uh, we have a very simple spectrometer, uh, which has proven successful, but was mainly designed as a test bed for the, the systems which would go into FrodoSpec, which is our main common user spectrograph. And that's currently under commissioning on the islands now. Um, and another imager, uh, RISE, which is a fast readout CCD. It has essentially zero readout time because it's a frame transfer device. So, um, yeah, you yeah, can operate in more like a movie mode where there's almost, there is essentially zero read time between exposures. Uh, also has a slightly wider field of view than the, the rack cam camera. Uh, next generation instruments will be, predictably, a wider field CCD and a wider field infrared imager. Uh, this time possibly with grisms and like all telescopes we're permanently trying to uh, develop the instrumentation suite. Uh, so I've said that the telescope is very ordinary in many ways. 
what is unique or different or special about a body telescope and the things that you have to make different in this case. Uh, the first is obviously it has to look after itself. It has to start up and shut down on its own. It has to open the dome. It has to have reliable weather sensors. These are some of our weather sensors half wired up. I can assure you the, uh, the wires don't hang down like that now. Before it was all wired up. So it's monitoring the weather for itself all the time. It's monitoring the observing conditions. It's monitoring the cloud levels. It's monitoring humidity, wind speed. Uh, in order to close the telescope, if weather gets dangerous to instruments, um, and to control which programs get done, and which them, and matching the observing program to the observing conditions. It needs to be very reliable. Um, it's no good if you have to go and fix it every night. Um, and this is obviously important to be designed in from the very, very start. And we were fortunate here that this project was starting from the ground up with a telescope that was designed to be robotic from day one. So that was always in everyone's mind when the electronics and the engineering, everything was being designed. Um, it, must, it must be able to run unsupervised for at least weeks, months at a time. And part of that then is logging, management, and recovery, automated recovery from faults. Um, it does have faults. Computers do crash. Breakers do trip. Um, you know, oil levels fluctuate in the hydraulics. All these things happen. But it has automated fault recovery systems built in so that it can automatically monitor the, the, the computers. The computers are the, by far you know, the commonest one. Um, some computer crashes or loss of comms or problem with the networking, anything like that. There are watchdogs running all the time that are monitoring all the systems and monitoring each other. If any communications go down, there are automated systems in place to reboot computers, restart software, and get back on sky. And typically, you know, if a computer crashes, if a computer completely dies, um, not terminally, but um, if it crashes, it's rebooted, restarted, and you're back on sky in 15 minutes, um, observing again, having done a complete system restart. It has to be fail safe. When things do go horribly, horribly wrong, it's got to close, it's got to close safe. And it's got to be safe for people to go in the enclosure afterwards. It's no good having things swinging around. It's no good the enclosure failing open when a rainstorm's coming. Now, all of those apply to any robotic telescope, um, even the, you know, the, the special purpose ones that I ref we talked about. Um, what's interesting to us, and as the big development that we've been excited about, is the autonomous scheduler. This is the software that is making those decisions of what observing programs to observe, in what order. Right, so for the ordinary, for the ordinary, for our illustrious observer, our much loved observers, what's the difference between using our telescope to anyone else's? Well, the first stage of application, time application, it looks exactly like we use the same forms as all the other UK telescopes uh, to apply for time. Uh, those go to a, a peer, review, time allocation committee. Astronomers get allocated amount of time. And that's where things start to diverge. We have a very, very rigorous phase two application procedure, which is becoming more popular, more common with telescopes. But uh, still, we have to be very, very rigorous on this, because this is the complete specification of all your observations, exactly what you want the telescope to do. And these then have to be uploaded to the telescope. And the important point here is that all those observations from all the PIs get uploaded to the database and sit there all the time, and they're all available all the time. We don't create a queue. We don't tell the telescope, tonight you're going to do this program, or even you know, do these three programs, or anything like that. The telescope, all the observations are sitting there all the time, and it's autonomously deciding for itself what is the best program to follow. Um, so to that extent, basically, the clever bit of the whole robotic observatory Basically, it all comes down to software. The hardware is important. The, the robust systems, the fault, fault recovery are all important. Um, but it's the, it's the software which distinguishes us from a classically scheduled telescope. Uh, observations are made automatically. The reduced data are all reduced. And an email gets sent out in the morning to say, the telescope observed your program last night. And that's the first thing that most observers know, that their, their program had been done last night. They get an email in the morning. They can download their data and go off and write their paper. Um, 
We said, look, we try and get everyone to upload their observations at the start of the semester, um, but there is always opportunity to modify your scheduling constraints uh, as you go along and change your requests, add objects, remove objects. So I so say you have to, we need a way of allowing observers to specify what observations they want. And I won't go through this in detail because it's a lot of words and it's not terribly exciting. But the point is we need ways of uh, the astronomers describing what observations they want. We focus here very much on the time domain aspect. So one which is not time domain really is the flexible observation. This basically just says, here's my target, I want an observation of it. Just do it whenever you can. The rest of these are all different ways of defining time sequences. Um, and this is an ever-growing list because you keep finding astronomers who want to observe something slightly different from what you ever anticipated. Um, so it's a very flexible list and the vast majority of programs we managed to fit into one of these systems that were designed. Um, all these, the, blah, 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 the interval is the only one we've added recently. Um, was a new observing mode that became obvious that a lot of people were asking for something particular. We could do it within the existing software infrastructure, but we found a more efficient way by adding an observing mode. Um, so these are just all different ways of, of, of putting in your time constraints. And then of course the target opportunity modes, uh, which are these rapid response. And rapid response might be might mean different things. It might be gamma ray bursts, where the telescope drops everything it's doing, slews to the gamma ray burst and observes immediately. Um, and that's all fully automated in software without any human interaction. Or it may be something like a supernova where you'd like an observation tonight but it's not desperately urgent, but then you want to observe it you know, every night. So you can't apply six months in advance for it because you only know when the supernova goes off. But uh, it can be, it doesn't, you know, it's not a drop everything and dive to it. It's a do this as soon as you get a chance. So there's various different types of target opportunity modes that allow the observers to add targets during the night to the telescope if they want to. Or you can add it during the day and it's available the following night. Um, this starts getting more and more complicated. I won't certainly won't go through all this, but just trying to uh, give you a, an idea of the sort of constraints that the scheduler has to use in order to decide what to observe next. One is obviously priority of the science program. If, if someone's got, if the tag ranked a program very highly, um, you want that to be boosted in the observing schedule. Um, you also want to boost uh, observations which are well placed in the sky at the time. They're high in the sky rather than setting low down on the horizon. And all these parameters have to go in and be applied through various weighting functions to decide which observation gets done. Uh, there are live feeds of the telescope systems on the web, so observe so people who have telescope time can check on the telescope and see what it's doing. Um, they can't do anything about it, but they can only watch, but people seem to like doing that. And the data are available in real time during the night if people want them. Within about 15 minutes of the shutter closing, the data are available for download to the PIs. An example of a, a JPEG, and obviously you've got links to the FITS files and the original data, the raw data, the reduced data. Um, Okay, this is a summary of all the different software processes. I don't know if any of you are software engineers or are interested in things like these block diagrams, but basically here, um, just giving you an idea of the, the communication layers going on between the different systems in the telescope. The actual telescope control system, steering telescope is down here, and our robotic control system, which we've developed, talks to that, and it talks to the instrumentation. And then there's various layers of abstraction going up through different software communication layers to this uh, observer support system, which is the database of all the observations that need to be done. And through various, mostly web-based, but some of them automated, some of them um, uh, SOAP, using um, web services interfaces, all currently um, evolving inf uh, communications protocols for machines on the internet to heterogeneous systems and the intent to communicate with each other and share resources. Yes. Um, so yes, most of our uh, internal infrastructure is based on Java software. Almost all the, soft almost all the software is Java. The 
as some C in some very time critical uh, operations, but the majority of it runs in Java. So I've told you how fabulous robotic telescopes are. There are problems. We call problems, we call them opportunities, whatever you want to like. Um, one thing we have learned, and it's become very obvious, is when you lose time, when the telescope goes down, you tend to lose large blocks of time. Instead of losing an hour here, an hour there, instead of losing a few minutes every night, which most telescopes do, when something goes wrong, you tend to lose several nights because we've got no one on site to fix it. If something breaks, which we don't have an automated fault recovery system for, that it can't fix for itself, you've got to get in an aeroplane. Or we have, we have contact with people on the island who can do some work for us. Uh, but basically, you tend to lose big blocks of time rather than little bits of time here and there. Um, and that, of course, then feeds through to your instrument design. You can't afford to have fragile, delicate, weird instruments on there. That doesn't mean you can't be innovative. It doesn't mean you can't design new and unique, unique instruments. I'll show you one in a minute. But they have to be robust and simple in a, in a, in a mechanical sense. Um, there's some lack in some sense of uh, user interactivity. You don't have the observer there deciding minute by minute what they want to do. They have to schedule observations in advance. And you can argue forever whether that's an advantage or a disadvantage, uh, whether astronomers should be allowed to dither during the night or whether they should be defining these in advance. Um, but there are ways around this. We have uh, agents, well, agent software processes running on the telescope, which do make automated decisions on the fly, such as the gamma ray bursts. Um, the gamma ray burst has an automated agent, software agent, running on the telescope, which, when, it, when it's alerted to the burst, takes the observation, uh, analyzes, reduces, and analyzes the data, and makes decisions on those data as to what to do next, whether to switch to a different instrument, whether to carry on in multi-band, multi-color imaging, um, dynamically changing the scheduling of the telescope as it goes. So there are ways of doing that. You just have to do it all in software, rather than doing it in an astronomer's head. The biggest headache, to be honest, is, again, coming back to cultural, is management, is being fair to all the users, um, making sure the users all believe you're being fair to them. It's very easy when you've got block scheduled telescopes, say, the telescope's yours tonight, go do it. Because the way we run, everyone who's been allocated any time thinks the telescope's theirs tonight. Everyone thinks they get it all the time. So that's quite a lot of work. Um, and some people might say that going to La Palma less is a disadvantage as well, but I wouldn't like to comment. <laughs> okay, so that's, uh, that's what I was going to say about robotic telescopes. Um, I hope I've convinced you that they are useful, will be useful, are worth pursuing. And I'll show you that we've got one that works. Um, and one way of showing you that it works this is going to run through some of the uh, science projects that are running on the telescope. How long do I have? OK, that's fine. Um, I'm not going to go through all these. I'll go through as many as I do before we run out of time. Some of these are published. Um, and some of these are still projects underway. But I wanted to give you uh, an idea of the, the breadth of work being done on the telescope to emphasize its common user, general purpose nature. Um, and just to give you some science today, as well as some technology. Gamma ray bursts, I suspect most of you know enough. I'm not going to go into this detail. They're very brief flashes of very luminous gamma rays. They're actually across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. First discovered in the 60s, but really no progress made until the early 90s. Um, when we knew anything about them at all, to be honest. They were just known as gamma ray flashes and nothing else. Um, Progress in the last 10 years has been very rapid and really is developing very well. But for the purposes of the robotic telescope, of course, the important point is that they're unpredictable. They're very, very brief. The gamma rays lasting a few seconds, the optical lasting, well, lasting for day, a couple of days, maybe, um, but fade incredibly rapidly. The brightest ones ever observed a couple of months ago was fifth magnitude, so naked eye visible. Um, at redshift 0.9, uh, but only for a few seconds. 
and then you know within a couple of hours it was down to the level where small telescopes couldn't see it and two days later we couldn't see it and then we were using VLT and 10 meter telescopes to see it but fading incredibly rapidly so you've got to be fast um, the first few minutes count <coughs> um, so rather than talking about GLBs in general and all the GLBs, I was going to talk about one particular aspect of GLBs which we made a quite exciting contribution to recently, which is polarization. The optical flash from the gamma ray burst is believed to be uh, synchrotron emission from an ultra-relativistic fireball. Enormous explosion of a star, ultra-relativistic uh, fireball propagating out into the interstellar medium, and you have synchrotron emission from electrons being accelerated in the magnetic fields, um, producing the optical emission. And of course, it's that fireball cooling away that causes the GRB to then fade. And of course, so because these are evolved magnetic fields, if you've got magnetic fields, you have aligned magnetic fields, and synchrotron can be very highly polarized. Um, GRB polarization is obviously of interest, because if there are magnetic fields, there's a good chance of polarized light, and that gives you another parameter to study on the GRBs. But actually, it's even better than that. Um, we believe the, GR, the emission from GRBs is very highly collimated beams. This is due to the um, sort of energy crisis that people very quickly realized these things were far too luminous to exist. Basically, the energy emission in a gamma ray burst is equivalent to a bright burst, is equivalent to complete conversion of a solar rest mass into energy in a couple of seconds. Um, which just can't be right. <laughs> the solution to that turns out to be that it's beamed. Those assumptions, these, you, the, your basic assumption when you see a brightness is just that you think that that's radiating isotropically in all directions. And that's how you end up with these enormous numbers like 10 to the 54 ergs in, for the NG in a, in a gamma ray burst. But of course, if you just put it out along a pencil beam, normally you, most people won't see the GRB, but if the pencil beam is pointing straight at you, you see it, it's bright, and you think, wow, that much light's coming out isotropically, it's really bright. But in fact, it's only coming out along a pencil beam. So you can push your energy budget down by a factor of 10 to the 4 or so. And when you account for that beaming of the energy, in fact, the total energy release in the GLBs is probably of order 10 to the 50 ergs, a factor of 10,000 down on the, the, the sort of the naive guess. So you know you've got jets, but how do you make the jets? Um, one very easy way to make jets is collimating magnetic fields, and the jets follow the magnetic fields. The magnetic fields are, are a nice arm-wavy way to start talking about jets. Um, or you can have hydrodynamically collimated jets, where the dynamics of the jet are not constrained by magnetic fields. They, put, they do contain magnetic fields in a chaotic bundle up manner, but uh, it's not a collimated, it's not a magnetically collimated beam. And those two have radically different results of polarization. If you're in a magnetically collimated beam, you expect very, very strong polarization. Um, I say here 10 to 50 percent in the first couple of minutes after the burst. If you're in a hydro hydrodynamically collimated jet, you don't expect to see strong polarization at all. So you've got a very, very simple prediction here. Strongly polarized, magnetically collimated jets, unpolarized, gamma ray burst, supports the hydrodynamical jets. So we built an instrument specifically to test this. There's a picture of it down here, which illustrates my point I made earlier about you don't want fragile instruments. It's novel, it's unique. We don't know of any other operating on a telescope in the world using this design. Um, and it allowed us to, to make this measurement. But you see, in engineering test, it's, it's, it's simple and robust and can be trusted to run the telescope for months without people having to tinker with it. There's nothing to tinker with. Um, the design is very interesting. It's uh, basically, if I describe what it does, the, the incoming beam from the telescope comes down to a, a fold mirror through the photometric filter, um, a Polaroid, a simple Polaroid to, to polarize the beam, and then this very narrow wedge. And what that means is the light comes in and pol polarized through the, the Polaroid and diverted very slightly, just by one degree or so, by this wedge. And the whole of this structure spins continuously, non-stop. So as it's spinning, of course, the angle at which it diverts the beam is being traced around. So a star in the, in the image 
becomes a ring. The star in the field becomes a ring in the image, and hence the name of the instrument, Ringo. But because the Polaroid is locked to the prism as it rotates, and they rotate together, as it rotates around that circle, it's also mapping the polarization signal as it goes around. So what you get in a, on the actual CCD image is something like this. And this is a blazar. If you look at the top left one up here, if you look, you've got your ring. But if you look carefully, you can see it's distinctly fainter at the top, top right and bottom left, and brighter on the left and right. Um, and that's purely because as the polarized going around, you're mapping the polarization signal. But basically, in this case, the polarization of this source was aligned in this direction between the two bright nodes on the ring. And these are three different observations of the same blazar in a high, medium, and low polarization state. And you can see there is still a little bit of signal here. But even by eye, you can see that the basic concept works. Um, and when it's in this high polarization state, you can clearly see that, that the contrast between the bright and the dark is, patch is greater. So then we take an azimuthal trace around that ring, just look at the brightness, map the brightness around the ring, and plot it on this graph. Um, you see you get a sine 2 theta. You can fit that. And then, fairly straightforward to, really obvious, to convert that back, that sine 2 theta back to both the polarization fraction for this source, which is basically just the ratio between the brightest and the darkest points on the fit, and the phase angle uh, tells you the orientation. So that's a demonstration of what the data looks like and that it does work. Here's our first GRB, and I confess only GRB that we've successfully hit with this thing yet. A DSS image, digital sky survey image of the, the field before the burst. Uh, this is where the burst went off. Of course, there's nothing there in the, in the digital sky survey. Um, so here's A is that bright star. Um, H is that star there. I is just off the field. And here's the gamma ray burst, which we see in our Ringo data. We detected it. And if we go through and do the analysis, so the, the big question is, is it 50% or 0? Is the only question we're trying to ask here. It's a fairly simple question. Um, and for this one data, this one object, we have a two sigma upper limit on our polarization of 8%, which, within the constraints of a single measurement and, and everything else, we see is a pretty obvious rejection <coughs> of the magnetically collimated jets. So basically saying, it's not saying that the jets can't be magnetically collimated, it's saying the optical emission region is not threaded by a strong, coherent uh, magnetic field, a line magnetic field. So that adds weight to this uh, the notion of the, the hydrodynamic gen, the hydrodynamic collimated jets, and that's we believe uh, the conclusion from these observations. Of course, now we're waiting and waiting for for another bright GRB that we can get and start building up a sample. But um, the nice thing was we were recognised by the uh, the Times. Here it's usually called the Times of London, I think, but in Britain it's just the Times. Um, and we were granted the Research Project of the Year Award, which was, which was very exciting and lots of fun. Um, but I put this on principally just because the last picture you saw of me, I was all scruffy and I wanted to prove that I do have a suit. <laughs> I do have a suit. <laughs> right, so I'll quickly rattle through a few other examples. That's, that's one which I've been involved with and um, has been a you know, high-profile result for us. But... Um, Microlensing surveys are ongoing. Um, uh, Ellen Kerens in Manchester is interested in looking at, and all the collaborators, uh, mapping the, um, or investigating the mass function of stars in M31. So here looking at microlensing uh, within the core of M31. There's been a lot of work done on microlensing of stars within our own galaxy. Um, but what they wanted to look for were stars in the in the bulge of M31, it's an image of M31 from the LT, um, being lensed by foreground stars in the halo of M31. And that allows them to investigate the mass function of the stars in the halo of M31. Um, so examples, just to show that it does work, they've measured this is an example from their data showing a microlensing event, a gravitational lensing going on here. Um, fits the theoretical model, the curving theoretical model, very nicely. At the same time, of course, you find all sorts of other variables. Uh, this is a, a fast classical nova. And they're following up these, of course, as well as interesting astrophysical objects. We 
discovered by this technique. This is nice to find large populations of classical novae in an external galaxy, in, again, in a robust statistical way with the same observations made in, in a robust way. So you can get statistics of populations in, these, uh, in an external galaxy. Um, this one I thought I'd mention because obviously planets are of some interest here as well. Um, this is WASP, which is one of these many other robotic telescopes I alluded to before. Uh, a special purpose robotic telescope that has a dedicated job of finding planets and has been very successful, about 15 to date, that are published. Finding them by the transit method. So here they're just looking, for, looking at the photometry. As the planet goes across in front of the surface of the star, you see a dip in the light curve. Um, and that's a picture of the SuperWASP instrument. Um, so not our telescope. So they find the planets. And once they've located one, they want to follow up in more detail and do more detailed analysis on it. Now this is the discovery recently published uh, of their 15th planet, WASP-15, and there is the eclipse happening in the middle there. Um, it's robust, it's sort of convincing, and it is convincing, you look at the data, there's no, I mean, no problem with it, but clearly you're not going to do an awful lot of analysis on this. You might have detected it, you know, it's there. This is about a four-day period. So you've got a four-day period here, and you've got a little dip the last couple of hours in the middle of about 0 0.02 magnitudes. One particular project they're really interested in is using these transits to look for smaller planets. These are obviously massive planets. These are the Jupiters going across in front of the, the star. That's what causes the photometric dip. But if you look at the dynamics of the, of the solar system, of the models of what these solar systems might be like, if there's an Earth mass planet in there as well, it can cause perturbations in the orbit of the Jupiter. So the Jupiter might go around every four days, but if it's interacting with another Earth mass planet in the same system, that can change the eclipse time by a couple of minutes, 10 minutes, over a few orbits. So you want to be able to time these transits very, very, very precisely in order to look for these small wobbles and perturbations in its orbit, to look for the other planets. Now, you're not going to be able to measure a few minutes time variations from this, which is why they work with us on the other They have time on the LT, work with us. I mean, they, they apply for their time. And these, then, are transits of the planets observed on the LT. Um, again, 0 0.02 magnitude eclipse here. But this is what you can do with you know, a big proper telescope, as opposed to their discovery telescope, their WASP telescope, which finds these things. And clearly, when you look at this, these are a period of a couple of hours here. Clearly here, if there are timing perturbations of a couple of minutes between orbits, they will easily be able to measure these changes from these data. Um, this is nice because it just demonstrates, again, this is another way of demonstrating the quality of the telescope, that we can do this millimag photometry routinely. Um, I think I'm pretty much running out of time, so I'll just mention what I brought far too many, and I was just going to keep going until I run out. Um, there was recent work done on the first ever detection of the Yorp effect, which is to do with the acceleration of rotation of small asteroids in the, in the solar system. Um, again, requires long-term monitoring of these uh, objects over several years and fitting to models. And uh, but it, never, it, it was a well-understood theoretical model that had been predicted and, and assumed for a long time, but never actually been observationally measured uh, to look at the, the spin-up, the, the, the increasing uh, speed of rotation of asteroids in the solar system. Uh, and there you've got the theoretical model and the black points, the data points. So this is work from... Uh, Lowry and um, Patrick Taylor at Cornell, uh, Lowry, and all his collaborators at Queen's University. Again, not, not our project. They're using our telescope. Um, AGN, uh, a lot of work on AGN monitoring. Again, okay, anything that's variable. So my conclusions. Um, the first thing I was trying to stress is that this word robotic means different things to different people. Um, and when people say they've got a robotic telescope, find out what they mean, because it does mean all sorts of different things. But with this restricted definition of the common user robotic telescope, uh, we think we've proven that it really can work, and it's incredibly powerful. Um, a lot of, uh, every one of the science results that I've shown you today was published in either Science or Nature, for example, um, in coming out of a two-meter conventional optical telescope. It's a very impressive record. Obviously, there's a lot more going on in the telescope than I've not been through. Um, 
But this, uh, this idea of operating a telescope entirely robotically in a common user mode, I think, is, is very powerful. It's not the only solution, and we still want classical telescopes as well. But uh, I, I strongly support people to, to pursue this as a, as a wavering telescope. Thank you. Uh, we, when I get, I get called up um, because um, I'm actually on the gamma ray burst science team as well. So we've applied for time and we have time, so I'm a member of the science team. Um, so we respond during the night to actually look at and analyze and write up results in real time. Um, I don't, in my capacity as the head of operations for the telescope, actually then interfere with the telescope. Um, I'm purely analyzing the science results that are coming back as an astronomer. Um, I can upload observations during the night um, using the various web interfaces, uh, but then so can all the other members of the science team as well. In terms of actually prodding the telescope and changing what it is going to do, we almost never do it during the night. Um, partly as a matter of self-discipline. Um, partly because it's not really necessary. We tend to make those decisions during the day. And um, if there is some reason that we know something's coming up, or if we hear from somebody, or there's a problem with the previous night's observations, we might make a decision during the day to, to force what gets done that night. But basically, no, we, we pretty much leave it, leave it alone. Um, if there is a technical fault in the telescope, I might log in and fix something. Um, but it would purely be on the matter of um, you know, restarting something which has not restarted itself. And um, I've probably done that twice this year. So it's not a, it's not a big thing. Um, the overheads for a, for a direct CCD image, or just a, a straight image, the overheads are of order two minutes-ish per observation. Um, in fact, the way we run it is we have a standard overhead which is billed to everybody. It doesn't measure how long it actually took. If your target happens to be right next to another one and it got to it very quickly, uh, you're billed for a standard slew time a 30-second slew, not for the time it took. But equally well, your next observations on the other side of the sky, you won't be charged the two minutes it takes to get all the way around there. You're just charged a standard. So we have an accounting model which uh, takes into account the average slew between two targets, an average filter change, an average instrument change. Um, and typically, uh, overheads are of order a couple of minutes. And we get onto, I mean, that's substantiated by the gamma ray bursts. And the gamma ray bursts, we typically open the shutter one and a half to three minutes after the alert. Uh, how would you handle the sort of uh, being in the sensory ability to see these out of the you know, How do you know that you're going to get the same? Um, the first answer is just that the telescope is so reliable it's not a problem. Um, the pointing is very good. Um, it's not it's not exceptional in terms of its fine accuracy, a couple of arc seconds. Um, we, we typically get about a 10 arc second RMS pointing at the moment, um, but we have some work. We know, we know of some things we can do to, to improve that. Uh, but that's actually that's fine. I mean, most of, all, all the images you know, are at several arc minute fields of view, so a couple of arc second pointing is, is irrelevant, to be honest. Um, for the spectrograph, it's important. So the spectrograph we have, uh, at the moment we operate in two different acquisition modes. Um, and this increases the overheads, the question about overheads just now. Uh, it's when you first request a spectroscopic observation, it immediately puts in the imager 
and actually takes a direct image of the field, produces that on the fly, and does source detection, and fits a world coordinate system onto that image using catalogs. So it's got catalogs, it's got whole sky maps, catalogs, and it will cross-correlate the catalog to the image in order to tweak up the pointing. So the first pointing typically gets you to within a, a few arc seconds of where you are. And then it takes an image, compares it to the catalog, tweaks the pointing, takes a second image. If it's happy then, it will switch in the spectrograph and go. If it's not happy, it will iterate until, until it is. But yes, yeah, so the, the narrow field of view on the spectrograph, uh, we, use, we have an integral field fiber-fed array. So we've actually got a field of view of about 10 arc seconds on the spectrograph. Um, so in fact, you'd quite often hit your target just with blind pointing. But we do have this, this iterative mode, images first. Um, there's another option. Instead of trying to fit the whole world coordinate system and you know, really tweak up the pointing, basically that's trying to improve the pointing of the telescope, we have an alternative mode where we tell it to go to the brightest object near this coordinate. So if you're doing bright star spectroscopy, you don't have to worry about doing the fits and all that. And it's much faster just to say, take the first image and then center up on the brightest object. And and just take spectra of that brightest object. Is, is your telescope still unsubscribed? Like most yes, yes. We're um, uh, the rounds for the next semester have just finished, um, <coughs> and the panels, the four allocation panels, three allocation panels, are all between about 1.6 and 2, which is not an enormous number, um, but actually it's a number we like. Um, I think if you go oversubscription rates higher than that, if you start getting to oversubscription rates higher than that, it can be counterproductive because you demoralize your users. And as long as you are slightly oversubscribed, you can throw out any proposals that are rubbish. And to be honest, there are very, very few proposals that are rubbish. Most astronomers write good proposals. So we're not too worried about trying to you know, go for subscription rates of 10 or whatever. But yes, it's, it is oversubscribed. So. Technically, yes, it's not common. Um, the time allocation committees, are, uh, there's the UK one. We do have a small slice of time that's reserved for internal within JMU and the national UK panels. Um, now, there's actually no rules. I'm not certain about the Spanish rules, but there are actually no rules saying that you can't apply, anyone can't apply to the UK PAT time allocation committees. I think, in principle, anyone is allowed to apply. Obviously not common, but uh, there's no rule against it. Uh, yes, um, we uh, offline for weather is about thirty percent of the available time. Uh, offline for technical faults is average over a few years, 5%. Um, that leaves you on sky about 65% of the time. Um, and that's all actual observing. It is, I mean, that, the way we count it is that we only call it on sky when it's actually doing something. Um, but the, I don't have numbers for what fraction of that time is what you'd call you know, open shutter time, for example. I don't have the numbers to hand because um, there's obviously these overheads. But again, it's just, that's again is an argument we've tried very hard not to get involved with because if you set open, sh uh, open shutter time as a criterion, that pushes you towards wanting fewer proposals and longer exposures. Um, because we encourage people to be doing short exposures and having lots of different proposals, and we want to have a wide variety of proposals on the telescope jumping around and doing all sorts of things at the same time, um, we sort of disable us. If, if, we, if we start worrying about open shutter time and worrying about the slew times, those are, those are contradictory. So we haven't worried too much about that as a criterion. But yeah, we're on Sky about 65% of the time, and experience on La Palma uh, photometric. Mm -hmm. You can ignore the one in the bottom left corner. We're photometric for about half the time that we're on sky. It's about 30% photometric, 30% spectroscopic, and 30% down. Are you doing uh, 
Uh, we start in February. February. We're locked into the, because of the time allocation rounds, we're locked into, because we are allocated through the UK Time Allocation Committee. So we're locked into their rounds, the same as all the other telescopes. We don't, we don't optimize it uh, in the sense you know, uh, how we do share them all. So we actually sort of, it's not optimized in a sense, um, but we don't let anyone have any of their own calibrations at all. All the calibrations are done generically for everyone. Um, the, the, they can specify in their proposal? In general, they can't, well, no. Um, they can specify some particular things they want, but of course, then it comes out of their time allocation. The, uh, the trick here is that we actually top slice time off the telescope for photometric calibrations and darks and all these sort of things before the allocation is made. So those, those calibrations are done automatically by the robotic system every night and are available to everyone and don't come out of your time allocation at all. So when you, when you write a standard application for a photometric program, you don't have to, if you don't want to, put in any time in your own allocation for standards, darks and flats. These are all top sliced and given equally to everyone. The downside of that means that uh, some of those frames will actually get taken even on nights when they're not needed, which is why I said it's not optimized in a sense. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a simple and robust compromise that way, to, to always calibrate the telescope for everything every night. And then everybody shares those calibrations. But then if someone decides that they want you know, their preferred way of doing whatever they're doing, it can be. There are, I mean, there are restrictions within our scheduling model. Um, there have been a few people have come up with things they specifically wanted to do that um, we couldn't accommodate. Uh, and the outcome of that is sometimes we've not been able to do it. But our general policy has then been to try and change the system so they can actually develop the system. Uh, our experience has been that responding to users' requests for changing the operation mode of the telescope leads to publications. Um, if you actually do things their way, or you, you add new functionality to the telescope, uh, people are sufficiently enthused by that, that they actually get on and write their papers. Um, so you know, we, we try and respond to people's requests there. Not always. <laughs> It's really up to the uh, up to the observer. Um, normally, I mean, for my own programs, yes. What I've done is I've requested sort of fifty percent more frequent observing than I really need. Um, but that's up to that's the way you write. On your side, not yeah, they, they they don't say what they don't say. I want this every I want this every three nights, and then we figure out for them how often we're going to really try. Um, they have to expect them to, to factor those in. Of course, we've got a lot of support. We have these support astronomers who work with astronomers to design those, those criteria. Um, but you, you saw we had like four or five different ways of scheduling timing. And they work differently in different cases. There was, if you want to have observations every other night, you could say, I want Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Or you could say, I want every other night. And I don't care whether it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And those are two different things. Um, and different science programs actually want them, want one or the other, and, and both are available.